Good morning. All right, children, you are dismissed to Children's Church at this point. Um, I'll tell you what, church is going to need your help a little bit today. I have been wrestling with the flu this week and uh, haven't had a fever for like 48 hours, so don't worry, you're not going to get it from me because I'm not going to hug you, you're not going to hug me, we're not going to shake hands, we're not going to even breathe the same air, right? Yeah, you just breathe your neighbor's air. I'm going to stay here, y'all can leave afterwards. But uh, I've got like zero energy right now. So why don't you guys uh, help me preach a little bit here and uh, you have the energy for me this morning. Um, I'm probably going to be leaning on this like this an hour from now. Actually, this may be the quickest sermon we have. (laughs) Um, We'll see what happens. I have no concept of time. You know what it means when a pastor takes his watch off? Absolutely nothing. Um, But I don't want to wear that anymore. (laughs) So let's open our Bible's up to Romans chapter 1. We're going to pick up with verses 16 and 17 today, which is, uh, I have been waiting to preach these two verses. It just bites that it feels so crummy right now. But uh, these are some of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. And Paul introduces us to his mindset here for a second. And so let's read it. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, I came to know Christ at uh, 18, really almost 19 years old. I was just a few months away from turning 19. And in my senior year in high school, uh, just before wrestling season started, I, was, I would go to church, but then once wrestling season got, got rolling into full speed there, um, I would even break up with the girlfriend I had at the time, and, and she let me date her twice like that before she f- figured out there was a pattern to what was happening there. But uh, I would leave the church. But just before I left the church, uh, this pastor came up to me and said, hey, you're a senior we're going to recognize our seniors in, co- in high school that are moving on to college. And so we need your life verse. Now, I'm lost, okay? My life verse is I don't know what that even means. Literally, at all. Had no idea what they're asking for. I was going to church just because there was a good-looking girl in this particular church. Mind you, it's not the girl I was dating, but it was another one. But she looked really nice, and therefore the church looked really nice but I had no idea what was in the scripture. And so here's this pastor telling me, hey, we're gonna put you in front of the church. We're gonna give you like this little notebook and tell you how awesome you are. And we put our hands on you and pray for you and celebrate the fact that, that this is your senior year in high school. And you're gonna be moving on to college. So what's your life first, Darren? And I'm like, life what? And so I, I literally, I can't make this junk up. I grabbed the Bible and started flipping and just thumb, thumbing my way through it and came of all verses to Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And I gave this verse as my life verse. And you should have seen the pastor's face when I did it. He was like, what? That's your, you, do you even know what that means? I'm like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know, I don't have a clue what it means. Shut up, just take the verse and roll on. Like I'm, you're stressing me out here. Every time I read Romans chapter one, I get to relive that story. (laughs) Every time I read Romans, like 10 times a year. So I've been reminded of this for 20 years now. That, hey, I put this down as my life verse, but you know what, (laughs) it's a good verse. The Lord knew it was my life verse when I was too dumb to know it was my life verse. And here's, the, here's a, a key for you guys in here as well. It's your life verse as well. This, these two verses, Romans 1, 16 through 17, are a summary of why Paul does everything he does and why we have hope in Jesus Christ. So I want to bring you into that understanding today as we look at two incredibly important verses that, that basically the rest of Romans is going to help us understand. See, this righteousness of God is a huge thing for us to grasp. And all of Romans is going to unpack that. 
See, when you get to Romans chapter three and he says, all are, are, are sinners, there's not one righteous, no, not one. And then you get into Romans chapter six where God uh, uh, is working to judge sin and we have it judged here at the last half of Romans chapter one as we move into Romans chapter two. And Paul is developing this entire understanding that God is righteous to judge us, but also to save us. And so the righteousness of God that is revealed from faith, through faith, or to faith, and, and as it continues on in the righteous live by faith, this is not a small thing. In fact, this is the reason you won't go to hell. So that's what I want to look at today. Now, we had a good setup. All the songs we sang should have had your, your, your mind and your heart and your entire being leaning into the fact that Jesus is wonderful. Sing hallelujah. He is risen. Lord, one thing I ask, one thing I desire is to see your face. Better is one day in your courts, in your presence, than thousands elsewhere. I'm just not so sure we actually believe that, though. You see, here's the thing. What's been happening at New Hope, I'm going to just go off script here for a second, okay? What's been happening at New Hope for the last couple of years is a return to authentic faith. Not that we were inauthentic. Not that something was necessarily wrong with only New Hope. But y'all, something's wrong with the American church. It doesn't love its Lord. It loves itself. It loves growing. It loves entertainment. It loves smoke and mirrors and lights and loud music and, and soft music and, and drama and production. And all these are an expression of something that should have value, but they should not be the value themselves. And we've turned the show into, the, our, into our purpose rather than understanding that our purpose is to abide in the Lord and to walk with Him and to encourage others to do the same. See, everything we exist for is for the glory of God. And so we strip and we change and we make it awkward and we make it uncomfortable and we stop in the introductions and we pray at the welcome time. And we sing songs and we don't push anymore to try to make these big productions Instead, we're simplifying everything down. We want to hear you sing to the Lord. We want to hear you pray to your God because you can't get to heaven on somebody else's faith. You have to get to heaven upon the work of Jesus Christ that you believe in, that you've accepted and received, that you've taken a knee before the great I am and have bowed down and are worshiping him. And there's no grandchildren in heaven. We are children of God or we are enemies of God and those are the only two positions you can have. But you can't be both at the same time. Praise the Lord. So I want to ask you, which one are you? Because this is why Paul writes to the Romans. Y'all, he is writing to the church. He is not writing to the lost Roman people. This letter is to the church. Who's the church? Raise your hand. You're the church. This letter is to us, and he's wanting to validate, to authenticate our faith. And so let's do that together today. Last week, I reminded you that our sincere love and worship of God does not guarantee our goals. Does not mean you and I are going to achieve everything we want to achieve, but it sure means God's going to achieve what he set out to achieve. And so though we don't really fully know what God is doing this, this tends to make us feel a little confused because we don't know the outcomes of our own plans or ambitions. We feel insecure. And because we don't know the, the, or see the clear agenda as to what's happening or we don't know when our mission is complete from, the God, from God or, or the mission God gives us, how do we know that this is from the Lord? Because we're confused as to what God tells us to do in our life right now. Like, how do we do what we're supposed to do? We don't see that with perfect clarity. Because of that, we struggle. And because we struggle, we tend to revert back to what is comfortable. 
When you think of God, come in close with me. When you think of God, he should make you feel insecure. There's no one you can liken him to. And there's no one that can control him. So if I, get, if I see God, and I see a God that is unlike anything I've ever seen, this makes me nervous because it means I can't fully understand him. This is also what the word infinite means. If God is infinite, he's without borders, which means he can't be contained even by our thoughts. So he's outside of our ability to comprehend. We can truly know him, but we can't completely know him. You tracking with me on this one? You can really know God, but you can't fully or completely know God. This disconcerns us. Then he is just like really, really powerful. Like infinitely powerful. This also makes us feel insecure. Because it means we stand before a God that doesn't need me, that I don't affect, that I can't hinder, that I can't manipulate, that I can't bribe, that I can't strong arm into doing what I want him to do. I am literally in his hands and he can do whatever he wants with me. We'll get to that later on in the weeks to come because Paul addresses that specific thing for a second. But... When you think about that, that makes me feel really anxious sometimes. Like, I am undone by the thought that God could come and step right here and I have no justification for who I am and what I've done. I would be found guilty of so many things. Does this, like, bless anybody right now? You should feel your heart beating a little bit, like, Oh, what does that mean? Am I in trouble? And because we feel this insecurity, because we know this fear, what it means is we often want to revert to what is comfortable in our lives. And now Paul is about to express a really marvelous view of God, but it's also going to be terrifying. And I love when we talk about the return of the Lord. It's called the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's great for those who are in Christ because we get to see Jesus. It's terrible for those who are outside of Christ because they will experience an eternity of weeping and gnashing of their teeth in hell. And this just doesn't bless anybody. So God is terrifying to us while comforting at the same time. But if you don't understand how to find the comfort in Christ, if you don't understand who God is, then as we begin to think about God and we see the terrifying aspect of God and the overwhelming aspect of who he is, of just his sheer magnitude, then we want to revert away and we want to go back to what is comfortable. And so Paul's presenting this God to the Romans and he understands that they are going to want to revert away. And so he tells them, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why those words? Why I am not ashamed? What a weird place to put those in. Right in your introduction, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Well, no duh, Paul. You're writing to tell us about it. We would assume you're not ashamed of that. Why is Paul saying I'm not ashamed of the gospel? Because you are. No, Darren, you're so hard on me. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Okay. How many people have you led to Christ in your life? Now, are we all ashamed of the gospel? Yes. Yes, we are. Did you lead anybody to Christ this week? This month? This year? This decade? That's not your family. Neighbors? Coworker? Kid on your team? Friend? Fishing buddy? Hunting buddy? We say we have life to its fullest. And the last person we've led to Christ is? Think about this. People come to me and say, Darren, why aren't we baptizing people? Why aren't we seeing salvations? Because you're not telling them about Jesus. That's your job. Nope, my job is to encourage you to do the work of the ministry. Your job is to do the work of the ministry. That's Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. That too is in the Bible. But when we think about this, we go, man, Darren, are you being hard on us right now? No, 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 no. I'm just trying to get us all on the same page for a second. I just want a proper evaluation of where we're at. 
See, I'm not so sure we can say what Paul said here. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not so sure everybody in this room can say that. Because you know what? I go out witnessing on Mondays. And there are times where I, not there are times, every time I am nervous and a little like, oh, I'm going to get made fun of. God, every Monday, for an hour and a half or so, I've been called a false teacher, a arrogant, proud person now, every single week for the last three weeks on Monday. I've been told I'm wrong for telling people that they should believe in Christ, which is funny because someone's telling me wrong, that I'm wrong for telling them my worldview when they are telling me their worldview, but yet they're, they're not wrong for telling me their worldview. Why are you so dumb? <laughs> is what I want to tell people sometimes. Like this, this, is, this is not logical. This is not how logical beings interact with each other. You can't say, hey, you can't tell me what to do. You just said I can't t- do something. So why can you tell me what to do, but I can't tell you what to do? And I know that's going to happen. So you know what happens to me every time? I'm like, oh, here we go. Please tell me why I'm an idiot. Begin. And it happens like clockwork. I mean, you just like put your watch and go click. All right, I'm going to get made fun of now. I'm going to get belittled. Someone's going to tear me a new one because I'm telling them about Christ. You know what that does? That makes me temporarily ashamed of the gospel. I don't want to do it. I don't want to be put to shame for Christ. But then you remember this verse, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. The the word power there is from which we get our our, our American word dynamite from. Dunamis is the Greek there. And it means power. That's why we translated it power. But you could put another word in there. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the dynamite of God for salvation. I love it. One commentator said, uh, I think it was Tozer, said, the gospel is like a lion just opened the cage. It'll do its thing. You don't need to defend a lion. The lion is way better at defending itself than you are. Right? Have you seen the claws of a lion? I'm not like going to help that thing out unless I got a really big gun. Just let the gospel out. But no, no, we're ashamed of the gospel. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for everyone in salvation. To everyone who believes, the Jew first, then to the Greek. What's he saying here? God offers this salvation to everyone, and therefore so will I. And I'm not ashamed of it. So here's what I want to get at. Guys, we feel great shame in Christ. Why? Why are we so silent? Why do when people criticize what the Lord is doing in our church, we don't say anything? We don't rebuke them. Why do when people criticize who the Lord is, we don't argue with them? We don't challenge them. We just let them go off in ignorance. Do we not believe that God is who he said he is? Why why when somebody challenges us, do we remain silent? Because we're ashamed. And so I want to show you two points from this passage. The first is an implied warning. And the second is the promises or are the promises. The implied warning of this text is I am not ashamed of the gospel, but you probably will be. So don't be. That's the implied warning. See, Paul's writing this, I am not ashamed of the gospel for the church. So they would know not to be ashamed of the gospel. Why are we ashamed of the gospel? I'm going to give you a couple categorical reasons for this. Number one, let's start with science. So I'm a geek, and uh, I've been reading on physics this week, quite extensively, especially cosmology. So as I'm studying physics in in the universe, and, and I love the theoretical aspect of it, and it's way outside my pay grade on this kind of stuff, but God gave me a brain. Why not use it to learn something new? And so you're sitting there trying to figure out, what am I reading in physics? And as I'm reading in physics, I'm noticing all of these attacks against the church, against God, against belief. One particular physicist who who I actually really, really like is Stephen Hawking. He's brilliant. 
He's just not saved and presently not alive. So put those two together. That's not a really good recipe for in, in the manner of how, what we believe. In his belief, he just doesn't exist anymore. See, only one of us can be right. In 2013, he said science has uh, proven there is no need for God. Prior to uh, modern science, he believed that a belief in God was a good thing because it helped us fill in the gaps. It's a God that fills in the gaps. And so what that means is in things we don't understand, we would, you, we would answer it by saying, God did that. I don't understand why this happened. Well, God did that. And that's called the God of the gaps. Anything that you can't prove scientifically, you just put God in there and God's the answer. And this is how most science, scientists view religion. That Christians or Jews or Muslims or Buddhists or whatever, their view of the world is just a God of the gaps. So their job is to answer the gaps. And as long as they can put a scientific theory in each of those gaps, there's no need for God. And they feel that they have filled in all the gaps. And therefore, there's no need for God. Except there's one big problem with science, and most Christians don't understand this. Science can only address what is physical, material, and what is testable and or repeatable or it cannot be proven. These are the rules of science. It's called the scientific process. You have to be able to test. Now, here's the problem with the start of the universe. It's not repeatable. Therefore, it's not testable. So, scientism steps beyond science and begins to add a philosophical, non-religious worldview to interpret its data, and it actually creates a religion that has just as much, if not more, need for faith than a Christian does. Because the reality is science can't answer everything. Science can only prove factual things that are physical. Science can't even test logic. Logic is not material. The deep thought for the day right there. Mathematics are not material. These are principles. Science struggles with truth, defining truth. It's not a physical thing. Now, the average Christian doesn't understand this. So we start talking to people who are scientists and they intimidate us because they're so smart. Okay, can I show you how one of the smartest men in, in the world thinks for a second? I'm opening myself up to great ridicule, but I don't care. He wrote this down. Stephen Hawking, de debating over the, the cause of the universe, decides to start saying that, hey, look, there, there, with almost beyond a reasonable doubt, a big bang happened and this started the universe, to which I agree. God said, let there be light, bang, there was. I agree with the Big Bang. You do too. Just not in necessarily how they parse it out. But check this out. Not only does the universe, did the universe begin with a bang, but that would mean that the universe was expanding. And so we've noticed this. Hubble helped us define this or see this, that the universe is expanding. Interestingly, no matter where you look from in the world and no matter where you look to in the universe, the universe seems to be expanding away from our solar system or from where we're at. You know, sort of like, I don't know, where we exist would be sort of the beginning of the bang, where God began the creation or whatever, I don't know. Something like that it might say in the Bible in the beginning, God created the heavens, the earth, the earth was formless and void. But, but anyways, that's just too easy of a theory to answer. That you, if you stand here right now and take the Hubble tel telescope, and you look into space, space is expanding from us. If you go to South America, take the Hubble telescope, and you look there, and it's expanding from us. If you go to the North Pole, the South Pole, if you look 360 degrees around, no matter how you look away from the Earth, the universe is always expanding away from us, which would mean the point of beginning is us. Okay, but that's just too easy of an answer. And so a guy, named Free, a guy named Friedman just didn't really like what that scientist named Friedman didn't really like that. So here's what he decided to do. 
he decided that he would put a couple of theories out there to explain why the universe always seems to be expanding away from us, but it can't explain that we are the beginning of the universe, so, because that doesn't help anybody out. That's a non-Christian. So let's try to come up with another theory. I said it doesn't matter where you're at in the universe, it would always appear to be expanding away from you. And so this is what the, the theoretical physicists began to do, and they tried to come up with a bunch of theories, and I love what Hawking said about the theory I just gave you, which is sort of a fact with evidence, that if you stand and everything is moving away from you, you're at the point of origin in the explosion. This is how physics works. Instead of that fact, Hawking says this, while we have no evidence for or against these other positions, we humbly submit them as just opinions or options that we really, really like. Let me get this right. The smartest man in the universe ignores the obvious point of origin for the universe, and without evidence or data, begins to argue for other origin points. And nobody calls him out on this. He puts this in writing. You know, their Bible, a science book. And ours is in writing too, and they argue with our writing. But nobody argues with their writing? Christians, why not? Are we dumb? Are we lazy? What's the answer here? Look, Christians are departing, so-called Christians, are departing from the faith because guys like Hawking and guys like Dawkins and others stand up and start arguing against your faith, but yet we don't challenge them. They challenge us. Why do you not challenge somebody who's challenging you? Because you're ashamed. See, science causes us to feel shame as believers. I've got to go faster here, but history does too. We got these things like the Crusades, the Salem witch trials, slavery in our background, epic racism, all in the name of Jesus. Like historically, I feel shame over that. The way we've subjugated women, in the name of Jesus, stepped well beyond what is biblical to keep people under our thumbs. Guys, this makes me feel shame to be part of the American church, but not of Christ. You know why? Because Christ doesn't call for those things. When you read the Bible, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God, but I am ashamed of my church that I'm a part of, the American church, not New Hope, the American church for how we treated people, how we've justified horrendous things. I feel, I feel shame for that. And you know what happens is a lot of times I don't want to say things to people because I know this happened to me uh, Monday two weeks ago, talking to a person about the Lord, and she said to me, the, the reason why I'll never go to church and never worship your Jesus is because your church preys on people sexually. I'm like, hold up, like New Hope? You got names? She's like, no, 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 the, the church. Like everybody. I'm like, oh, so just every, every church <laughs> preys on people sexually? She's like, yeah, no. The stats are it's 3%. Same, that's actually not terrible stats, it's terrible to sexually abuse people. I'm just saying 3% is not what's happening nationally. Sexual predation is much worse than 3% nationally. But no, because we have some stupid leaders that have abused people sexually, the whole church gets lumped in as being a disgusting, evil thing to which we feel shame over that. We feel shame with our, our ignorance in science. We feel shame with our historical background. We feel shame in how we relate to other people. And we're being forced to feel that shame. Our sexual ethic goes against culture, doesn't it? You guys awake with me this morning? Come on. 
Hello? I didn't see any head nodding there. Like three people were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our sexual ethic goes against culture, does it not? Yes, this makes it very hard for you to open your mouth because you know you're going to be ridiculed. You know you're going to be made fun of if you say the scripture says one man, one woman for one life. And if you change anything but that, that's not the biblical sexual ethic. And so we start having problems with people because of things like this. The way we live our life, what we don't pursue for pleasure, how we pursue pleasure in a limited format. God created fun. God created joyful things. God created happiness, not Satan. But you got to make sure that pleasure doesn't have you. It can't be your God. It's all right to have fun, but don't let fun have you. And too many of us pursue this pleasure. We pursue this life. And the church says, through the word of God, negative, take up your cross and follow Christ. And that just makes it very, very, very hard to live in this world and not give offense to other people relationally. And so we feel shame because we're supposed to live differently. There's numerous other ways that we feel shame. But Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. So let me ask you, are you ashamed of the gospel? Because the warning there is intended to highlight the promise. What's the promise? It is the power of God to all who believe. How so? For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Here's the great thing about the gospel. The gospel is God. What's the promise of the gospel? God. God is the promise. One amen. One amen. God is the promise of the gospel. You get to abide in God and God abide in you. You get this oneness, this unity with Christ, this union that is absolutely unmatched in the world around you. And this is why we are not ashamed of the gospel. If you are ashamed of the gospel of Christ, it is because you are not united with Christ through the gospel of Christ. You are a fake believer. Yeah, I said that. If you are ashamed of Christ, you don't know him. Because I am ashamed of no one who has the right to occupy the office they occupy. Amen? I may not like our president of the United States, or I may like our president of the United States. It doesn't matter, but he rightfully occupies that office. And if he walked in here, we would obey him more specifically, the Secret Service. So when they told us to put our hands up and searched us, we would be like, because you're not shooting me in front of everybody. I'm not that moron. You don't argue with the commander in chief, or commander in chief of the United States. You don't argue with his detail. He has the right to occupy that office. And so when he comes in, we give him the right. Whether you agree with that person or not. Used to work on a military base. And so as you go into work, I don't know if that, who that colonel is, if he's the colonel of broom sweeping or uh, who has the nuclear codes. Like, I don't know. You know what my hand knows? Every time you saw him on the base. And it, you held it there until he did what? Until he saluted. You never were just like, what's up? You never pass a superior outranking officer and go, how you doing? Negative. I don't even have to know the guy. That's not happening. Because he has the right to occupy that office. So you show them respect. You would, who remembers this phrase, make a hole? Who served in the military? Make a hole, you remember that phrase? Make a hole, what's that mean? Get the heck out of the way for somebody who outranks you. That's what make a hole means. It doesn't literally mean you're digging something. It just means whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter because they are way more important than you are. So, and you're like, no, he's not, or she's not. I don't even know how that person has a pulse. Like, they don't matter. 
but they outrank me. And so if, they, if someone was coming through, you'd hear uh, lesser military members say, make a hole so this person could come through wherever they wanted to come through. And you got out of the way for them. Now, we show respect to officers, to police officers, to people who are just people. But when we think of Christ, we're ashamed of him? Mm, we must not know our God. We must not know who he is and what rank he holds. We must not know the power that's associated with him. See, the, the warning, I am not ashamed of Christ, is rooted in who Christ is. So Paul's non-ashamed of Christ is because Paul is occupied by Christ and indwells Christ and Christ indwells him. He has this union with Christ and because he's seen the marvelous God in the flesh and he knows his Lord by name and his Lord knows him by name, suddenly nothing else in this life has weight or glory or merit to it other than Christ. What's your view of God? What's our view of God? Who's still reading with us through the reading plan? Okay, sweet. Praise the Lord, actually. That's awesome. All right, I'll clap. Good on you guys. It's all right. We'll get you awake here. Only got two hours left. But as we sit here and go through the reading plan, you should have read something in Matthew talking about, I don't know. Sorry for waking the baby up. The end of bad idea. Church, you're bad for clapping. You shouldn't have clapped. We, all right, everybody go back to being Baptist. We're going to be quiet now. All right, <laughs> joking. But here's the deal. You should have read the warning about being ready for Christ this week. Are you ready for Christ? And what does it mean to be ready for Christ? Let me ask it this way. How do you view the return of Christ? Do you Look forward to it with expectation. Like, this may be, this is such a light example, but here we go. When I go on a mission trip, or when I go on a work trip, and I've done this for, for years. Beth and I have been married for 15 years. When I was in the police department for the first five years of our marriage, I worked, I had to go train six weeks a year. So I would relocate to a different uh, uh, training facility for a week at a time, sometimes two weeks, and while you're gone, um, she can't come with me. She's raising the kids, and so I'm going down to central Georgia to do this or whatever, and so there's no driving back and forth while you're in training, and, and sometimes I'm in Virginia or Orlando or doing whatever, and I can't wait to get home. I can't wait to get home and see my kids, kiss my wife, hold my babies, eat a good meal. I can't wait to get home when I'm gone. Why? Because I love them. I'm not thinking when I get home, she's gonna fuss at me, though that has happened. That's not a regular occurrence. So you're like, eh, I'm probably a jerk anyway, so I had that one coming. But when I'm getting home, you know what I'm thinking? I can't wait to eat a meal, watch a movie, hang out, roll with the kids on the floor, whatever. Take the uniform off. I couldn't wait to get home. I couldn't wait to get home every night from work. I'd go in at 6 p.m. at night, and when it came to an end at 6 a.m. in the morning, I couldn't wait to get home, get to sleep, get up, and eat lunch with them, and then before you go in, go do the whole thing all over again. It, dry, it still drives me. I can't wait to leave the church to go see family every night of the week. I love seeing my family every single day. Amen. <laughs> but here's, that's how you say amen, church. But check this out. I think many of us dread seeing Christ because we think there's better stuff here. We think there's more fun to be had here. See, that makes us ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That makes us less likely to love the Lord. If you want to be ready for the Lord, what that means is you want to see Jesus. You want to see the Lord. And you're like, Maranatha, come, Lord, come. But I think many of us are like, not today or tomorrow 
or preferably if I could die a rich old age and my children could die a rich old age, then you can come about that time when I don't know my great grandkids or something like that. I've been in a youth group numerous times. We're like, I want to see Jesus, just not till we have sex and get married. And today it's in that order. Used to be a different order. And you're like, hold up, I'm not so sure you necessarily want to see Jesus. Adults are like, I, I want to see Jesus, but I want to see Mexico first. Namely Acapulco or Cancun. Or I want to see Jesus, but I, but I want to retire and live it up. And then just before I get cancer, if he want, or right after I get cancer, just before it gets really bad, we all cry. If he wants to come back, that would be awesome. So let me get this right. Jesus ranks just higher than cancer. Or just higher than sex. Or just higher than a vacation. Or just below that, depending upon where you put him. Do you really want to see Jesus? That sounds like we're ashamed of the gospel. That sounds like we don't actually believe what the Bible tells us to believe. And we'll go over extensively for the next couple years what Romans teaches us about belief and what it looks like. I just want to start with shame today. What do we view Jesus as? Are we ashamed of him? What do you value more than Christ? So here's how we're going to end this. I'm just going to ask you to pray where you're at, to talk to the Lord. If you realize that Jesus is not primo in your life, he's not first, he's not foremost, he's not what you're longing for, if you realize that you are ashamed of him, guys, Repent. Just tell him you're sorry and ask him for the opportunity, the strength, and the guidance to submit to his lordship. You don't make him first. He is already first. You're just being stupid and challenging him. So we want to stop challenging him. I meant that the way I said that. It's stupid to attack the president of the United States, is it not? How much more ridiculous is it to challenge God? So if we are fighting to pull God out of his throne and put something else in there, we're probably going to want to stop that right now. Like right now. Today is the day to repent. And if you realize that's you, then just right now, seek the Lord and say, God, forgive me. Give me the ability to submit to you. Next. Read his word. Stop doing it your way. There's no way around that. Darren, you have the same point of application every week. I know. It's so crazy. I can't believe I have to come back every week. I can't believe I have to remind myself every day to do the same thing. I don't have to remind myself to go to the bathroom in the morning, but I have to remind myself to read the word of God. How dense of a person am I? I don't have to remind myself to breathe, but I have to remind myself to pray. How dense am I? If you realize that's you, then start doing it. Don't put off tomorrow what you can do today, because what if today your life is required of you? What if today your last breath is taken? What if today he broke through those clouds when no one would expect it on a Sunday morning at 1.30? <laughs> You're like, wait, did he just say morning and 1.30 together? That's how long we're staying here. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Church, if you're good with the Lord, good. Be bold. Proclaim him. If you're not good with him, fix that right now. Father, we thank you for your great love and mercy. Jesus, we thank you for how you took our place 
Therefore, there is freedom in you to approach you, to come to you, because we don't have to try to pay the penalty of our sins. You did. So Jesus, we glorify you for that. You died on the cross in our place, and there now no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins because you paid it. You are the sacrifice. You are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when you said it is finished, you took away our sin in the past tense. So Lord, even now, while we may raise our hand up against you, we know that we can take a knee before you, and it's gone. All the sin is gone. Forgive us for rebelling against you. Holy Spirit, guide us to walk with you, to know you, to live in fellowship with you. Just as I can't wait to get home to see my family, Lord, I ask that our souls would long for you with an even more intense desire than that. Let us look to you all the days of our life, and then one day we will know you fully as we can know you instead of how we know you now, which is through a distance, through a dark glasses. Paul teaches us in Romans, or 1 Corinthians 13. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in this body. Please don't stop with us. Move beyond us. Let us carry the gospel out. Let us encourage our friends and family who are nominal Christians, which I don't even know if that's a thing to be po- a thing that's possible. So Lord, we pray for those who are nominal, that they would get off the fence. We know what you do with those who are nominal, lukewarm. You vomit them out of your mouth. Lord, make us hot for you. Let us not be an abomination to you, but rather walk with integrity be what you've called us to be through your power, through your sacrifice for your glory and your honor and our good. God, we love you. It's through your holy name we pray. Amen. Love you, church.